Bon, nous allons commencer. Bravo et merci à ceux qui ont bravé les transports. Et après donc un long débat, nous avons décidé euh, qu'aujourd'hui, nous allions parler en anglais, euh, notamment parce qu'il y a une captation vidéo et que nous avons une audience mondiale. <laughs> uh, et so I'm going to switch to English uh, myself. Uh, nevertheless, you can ask questions in French afterwards, uh, and uh, it's no problem to be bilingual in the uh, discussion. So I would like to uh, welcome and thank uh, Thomas uh, for being with us today. Uh, it's a great pleasure to uh, present his book, The Great uh, Reversal. So you know uh, Thomas Philippon, uh, probably. He's a professor at uh, NYU. Uh, he's, uh, mem he's uh, He used to be, uh, until very recently, a member of uh, uh, the board of the ACPR. So it's pas familiar to you, um, to, from the Bank de France. Um, he's, uh, he, uh, he holds a PhD from MIT and a master from PSC. So it's, very, uh, it's a honor for Paris School of Economics uh, to welcome him together with the Bank de France within the program of the share Uh, the Cher uh, Banque de France uh, PSC. Uh, so uh, he has received many awards. Uh, awards I will not go into uh, to, 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 to details this. Uh, he has, uh, more importantly, he has developed an in-depth research on comp competition, part of it with uh, German Gutierrez in recent uh, years. Uh, also some research on the banking industry, uh, notably a uh, highly cited paper with Ariel uh, Reshef in the QGE in... Uh, 2012, 
on the remuneration of uh, in uh, finan the financial industry. So probably today we also we will also talk about the financial industry, was a very interesting chapter in the book. Um, he has also worked on bank efficiency, systemic risk, um, recapitalization, the Greek uh, crisis, and so on. He has also uh, a book, Le Capitalisme d'Héritier, uh, from 2007. So today he's going to present his new book, The Great Reversal, How America Gave Up on Free Markets, just published at Harvard University Press. So this book, uh, as I understand it, comes out from some accumulated uh, research. So it's really a research-rooted uh, book, but directed for a general audience. Uh, and I think, well, I read the book like, uh, it, it's like a story. So it's like he's in conversation, con it's a conversation with a reader, uh, like with friends, I'm going to explain to you. And uh, don't worry, I'm going to help you to understand. You may wonder why, ta ta ta, you, I'm going to explain you. This sounds a bit difficult, but don't worry, I'm going to explain. And so this is very nice. I think it's an entertaining reading, as someone has uh, put it uh, on Amazon website. Uh, and I think it's a new way of uh, talking uh, about economics to a general uh, public. And this is also uh, important for us to uh, think about how we talk to the public. So I think it's uh, very valuable also for this reason. And um, so I'm going to stop here, probably. Uh, so I, I forgot to say, I'm Agnès Benassikere. I am the co-director uh, uh, of the share with uh, Olivier de Bant from the Banque de France. I'm from PSC. And um, we, uh, so I would like also uh, to welcome uh, David Spector, who is going to uh, uh, to comment on the presentation by uh, Thomas. So thanks, uh, David, for having accepted our invitation. So David is a professor at Paris School of Economics. He's uh, specializing on uh, these issues of uh, competition industry, uh, policy, uh, um, competition policies, and so on. So thanks to all of you. Uh, and thanks to Olivier Garnier, who is going to uh, lead the debate. So um, now it's your to explain how it's going to work. So I, I okay. So Thomas, if you want, please. So thank you all for coming. And uh, like Agnes said, we, we're going to do the presentation in English because uh, there are some English speakers in the room and also online. But um, if you want to ask your questions in French. Of course, uh, no problem during the discussion. Um, so thank you for coming. Thank you for uh, inviting me to present the, the book. The title is A Great Reversal. And um, the reason I chose this title is because, um, well, because it was a good title, I hoped. But uh, also because it corresponds to what I experienced when I moved uh, to the US from Europe 20 years ago. Um, so I went as a student in 1999, actually after having spent one year at PSC and one year in London. Um, and when I arrived in, uh, at MIT, so in Boston in 1999, it was quite striking that many of the uh, goods and services that I wanted to buy were much cheaper in the US. So this was a time period where, you know, when you had friends in the States, you would ask them to bring back laptops for you because laptop prices were, you know, like 30, 40 percent cheaper. Um, when you lived in the U.S. as a student, uh, until, uh, until I moved there, I would never imagine taking the plane to go to a conference. That was just not something we would do. Uh, but in the U.S. it was possible because airline tickets were much cheaper than in Europe. Um, similarly, when you uh, wanted to work on the Internet, because of the deregulation in the telecom industry, you wouldn't, you wouldn't pay by the minute for local calls. So to connect to the internet 20 years ago, you needed a modem and dial-up connection. But th that means you were using the landline. And if the uh, server was in your neighborhood, then it was a local call. So you could stay on the internet for like an hour without paying by the minute. The same thing in Paris, that didn't work. You would pay by the minute. Uh, and then soon after I arrived, we started uh, using cell phones a lot. And similarly, cell phone plans were much cheaper uh, in the U.S. then than in France. 
So all of these facts were very striking, especially at that time I was you know, a student, so I didn't have any, much money at all, so I actually paid attention to prices. And um, what's striking is 20 years later, every single one of these facts, every one of them has reversed. It is now much cheaper to fly domestic uh, flights in, within Europe, within France or within Europe. It's much cheaper to have uh, broadband internet connections at home in Paris than in New York. Uh, cell phone plans are half the price here than they are in the US. And the list goes on. So somehow within this 20 year period, something has happened where, you know, or in relative terms at least, prices have come down here and have gone up in the US. And so that's what the book is trying to understand. This reversal of the degree of competition in, in the market. So it turns out, of course, that it's part of a big debate in the US about the evolution of industries. So this is a uh, simple measure of concentration. You just count the market share of the top eight firm. So it's called CR because it's, it's, it means concentration ratio. So this is the market share of the top uh, eight firms in their industry. And uh, the baseline number is something like 0 0.3 or 30 uh, percent. And uh, it's gone up by about you know, seven or eight percent. So it's gone up by something like a quarter or a third. And if you do it in more detailed levels in some industries, that's the order of magnitude that you see on average, like an increase in concentration by a factor of you know, a th quarter or a third. Um, the big question, that's true in manufacturing, in non-manufacturing, it's true in you know, most uh, in industries. So that fact, I think, is roughly uh, accepted by, by most people. What is not accepted at all is the interpretation of the fact. And um, so there is a lively debate there about why do we see this concentration. And um, I think it's useful, even it's a bit of a caricature, but it's useful to frame the debate in just two polar cases, good and bad concentration. So when you could have good concentration if what's going on is that the top firms in the industry just become even better than the next ones. Okay, so the leaders increase their advantage over the following firms. In that case, probably because they, they innovate or they become more productive. And uh, in that case, what you would see is their market share would would grow, so you would measure an increase in concentration. Um, but it would be driven by the increased e efficiency of the leading firms. So this kind of concentration would come together with lower prices and uh, higher productivity. So examples of that in the US in particular would be uh, very clear in the retail and wholesale trade uh, sector. And uh, most of the time when we see this happening, uh, it also comes together with heavy investment in intangible assets. Oftentimes, uh, information technology, but also you know, all kinds of intangible uh, investment in brands and, and products that people actually like. So when we see this you know, combination of, uh, um, of features, concentration, but together with lower prices, lots of investment in intangible and uh, productivity gains, and we think it's the good type concentration. It doesn't mean, of course, it doesn't create some problem at some point if the market share of the top firm becomes really, really large. Even if it got there by being super efficient, you might still worry at some point. But at least along the transition, it's good. And then the, polar, the, the opposite case is when concentration is driven not by increased efficiency of the leading firms, but instead, by the fact that the firm can protect itself from competition. Um, in that case, you would see concentration, of course, because you would have less entry or less growth of smaller firm in that industry. Um, but because it's, it's really driven by barriers to entry as opposed to productivity, then typically you would see higher prices and less productivity growth. So examples of that in the US would be the telecom, airlines, healthcare industries. Okay. Um, if that's the story, then there's still an, an open question, which is of what exactly are these barriers to entry? You know, why, and why is it that they would be higher today than they were in the past? We still need to answer that question. So that's kind of the two camps. Now, of course, this is a caricature. The real world is always in between. So the real world is always a mix of good and bad concentration. And the interesting question for research is just to figure out, you know, how much is the good type versus the bad type, okay? 
Um, we know that he's not going to be 100% wide versus the other. The only question is, what's the fraction? Um, once you if you manage to answer that question, then there is another one which is connected, and it's policy versus technology. If you see this trend in concentration, is it driven by technological change, or is it driven by policy decisions? And of course, that's important for the public debate. Right? So that's, these are the two questions I want to try to answer. Um, so we start with an example of good concentration, just to set the stage. That's the expansion of Walmart uh, in the, roughly from the mid-80s to the mid-2000s, so 20 years. In 20 years, Walmart went from zero to 60% market share. Um, in its category, that's like the category is like uh, general retail stores. Um, so it's a gigantic increase in market share. It became by far the largest em private employer in the US, ac actually uh, in the world, I think. Um, but what's interesting is if you look at the expansion of Walmart, um, the driving force was extremely high investment in uh, information technology and innovation in the, sub in the you know, management of inventory. So these are the ones, these are the people who invented the just-in-time management, the fact that you know, if you go to a store, as soon as you scan the item, when you buy it at the store, the message is sent directly to the production facility in China so that you know, more can be produced. Um, importantly also, they, are, they, they created a system where uh, suppliers, so people who produce the goods, can directly log in to the Walmart system so they know in each Walmart store how many of their goods are there so that they can ship the right amount to the right store. So all of that was actually uh, pioneered by Walmart. Um, that gave them a very significant cost advantage over all the other retailers. So they started cutting prices and killing all of the other retailers. So there is no question that that was very disruptive. They put out of business many, many uh, smaller businesses as well. Um, there was controversy when uh, Walmart was expanding, one, because they were killing small businesses, and also because the, you know, the labor management was pretty rough. So I'm not saying it was smooth or uncontroversial, but what is for sure is the, cost the customers, the clients, got a good deal. Prices went down, okay? Productivity went up, and over the expansion path, what you this is the profit margin of Walmart, it's kind of flat. I mean, there's a little bit of a decrease here, which is mostly driven by the, co by the composition effect, so their growth there was in relatively lower margin product. Um, but if you go product by product, their margins was kind of flat, okay? Then mechanics, that means that almost one for one, all the productivity gains showed up as lower prices for consumers. So when we see this kind of expansion, we think that that is an efficient type of concentration. Interestingly, of course, at the end of the sample, around the mid 2000s, Walmart market share is almost 60%. So the actual, the uh, antitrust authorities in the US were a little bit worried about Walmart becoming too dominant. Um, and so there was much discussion about what to do with Walmart. Um, maybe, you know, put a break on their expansion. Also a limitation, so at that point, Walmart applied for a banking license, that's interesting. They wanted to get, a, and they got denied, in part because they were too big. Um, and I think if the world had not changed, maybe we would be talking about antitrust action against Walmart today. But of course, something else happened here, and that's Amazon. Okay, so right at the time where we thought maybe Walmart was becoming too dominant, Amazon appeared, and then that solved the problem of competition in that, in that market. And that's the usual way we think the, the world should work, which is, you know, you have entry, you have expansion, and maybe you become too dominant, but it, it's not a permanent position because another one is gonna come and compete with you. That's the way the market should work. The problem is that over the past 20 years, this is not exactly what has happened in the US in many industries. And uh, there's a few things that suggest uh, that it's, uh, you know, the, the evolution is in the wrong direction. The first one is uh, if you look at the behavior of investment. So usually when we see these efficient expansions, it comes together with lots of investment, both physical and intangible. But over the past 20 years, investment has been actually lower than you would think uh, in the US. And uh, this is a measure of that. So this is based on uh, you know, the benchmark theory of, competition of uh, investment that we teach. So we look at the net present value of uh, profits. We compare that to the cost of buying more equipment. We compute the ratio of the two, that's uh, Tobin's Q. And then, you know, if it's high, then it's at the margin, it's a good idea to invest, and so firms should expand. Uh, 
in recent years, of course, that's what we've seen. Profit margins were very high. Um, they are capitalized in very high stock market valuation. Um, funding costs are very low, so whether you want to fund your um, expansion by retained earnings, uh, equity, or debt, in all cases, you know, you have plenty of cash to do that. And despite all of these very good conditions for investment, we didn't see a big increase in investment. In fact, investment rates have been surprisingly low in the US. So that's kind of a puzzle. But of course, if you think that part of this increased profits come from monopoly rents, then it's not a puzzle anymore. Because precisely a monopoly would have high profits, high valuation, but at the margin would not want to expand its capacity. So it would not invest a lot. Um, so that's the first thing that got me thinking that maybe there's something like that going on in this, in this market. Um, and then you learn by also um, decomposing um, this lack of investment across industries. So this is like the growth of concentration. But of course, this growth, uh, that's the average. It's more in some industries and less in some other industries. So here, what I do is I just sort industries in two bins. This is the uh, bottom decile for uh, concentration ratios. So these are industries where the increase in concentration has been the smallest. As it turns out, it's actually close to zero. So these are industries where concentration was roughly constant over the sample. And these are the ones where concentration went up the most. And what I'm putting here is the gap between where you think investment should be based on fundamentals, that is profitability and valuations relative to cost of investment. So the gap between where investment should be and where it actually is. What you see is that in industries where concentration did not change, then the gap is close to zero. But in industries where concentration went up the most, the gap in actual investment is very large. The, the aggregate, the average for the US economy, the gap is around 7%. So the capital stock is about 7% too low compared to fundamentals. Um, but that 7% is an average of zero for industries that have remained, uh, where concentration has remained stable, and you know something like 14% for industries where concentration went up a lot. So that's consistent with the idea that this kind of concentration is at least suspicious because it did not come together with lots of uh, investment and innovation. Um, you can look at other indicators. So, of course, the first one, you look at how much profit firms are making, and the profit rate of firms has increased a lot over exactly the same period of time. Um, the flip side, the labor share of income has decreased over the same period of time in the US. Um, so all that suggests that, um, on balance, we have more today of the inefficient type of concentration in the US than we did in the past. Um, but then it doesn't tell you exactly why that's happening. You still don't know if it's like technology in the background or is it uh, you know, policy. And that's when I think Europe becomes like a very interesting uh, comparison. So initially when I looked at Europe, I was just looking for a comparison group just to see if, if, you, if you believe it's pure technology, then in many industries that have the same technology, you would have the same trend. So I, I started looking at European data just with that in mind. And much to my surprise, I discovered that in Europe, the trends are not the same at all. So concentration first, the green is the US. Actually, this is North America, technically. That includes Canada. Um, that we've seen before. This is for Europe. Now, for Europe, uh, the, the estimates are a bit more ambiguous. But within a, so if you look at concentration trend in Europe, some papers find a small decrease. Some paper find it's flat. This is the, I'm showing you the paper that finds a small increase, okay? That's the OECD data. Um, I think the truth is it's flat, actually. Uh, but depending on how you count, how you measure, how you consolidate the accounts and all of that, you know, it can be small negative, zero, or small positive. But in all cases, much less than in the US. Okay. Also keep in mind that in Europe, we have at least in some industries, we have the beneficial effect of the single market where we have good concentration. Like if you create pan-European groups, um, then you, you could have higher concentration, but for the good reason. I mean, the prime example would be the car industry. You know, we have maybe the number of independent car manufacturers is smaller, but we don't think there is less competition. Um, so something else is going on in Europe compared to, to the US. Um, and then, so that got me thinking, okay, maybe I want to look at 
what's driving the evolution in Europe. And there, what was very striking was that uh, if you look at industries where the trends are very different, almost all the time in Europe, you find significant policy changes. Um, Sometimes antitrust, more often uh, deregulation or changes in regulation. So this one is the price of communication. Okay, so remember my story at the beginning, I, I, I got to the US and then cell phones and internet connection, all that was much cheaper in the US. Okay, that's like, actually I don't have 99 data, but that's around here. And you can see this is the data from the World Bank. So this is literally just the price index of communication services, which unfortunately is a bit broader than I would like. So it includes not just, uh, you know, cell phones and uh, uh, broadband internet. So it's not that granular, it aggregates a bunch of stuff. But you know, we were like 10 to 20 percent more expensive than the U.S. And now we are so in 2014 we were like 25 percent cheaper. Now we have like 40 percent cheaper. Actually, the trend has continued. What happened here? That's free, the entry of free. Uh, we had three mobile carriers in in France, and it was the classic um, oligopoly, you would say. And then you give a license to free. In 2011, they enter. They price their baseline contract as half, like the 20 euro contract, in, instead of the 45 euro contract that the incumbents have. And within you know, three years, the prices go down. Six months, actually, it took six months, I think, roughly, for the incumbents to match the price of free. And then everybody got, you know, essentially a 30, 40 percent uh, drop in the price for their cell phone plans. And that has persisted until today. So that's how we got much cheaper than, than the US. Uh, so that's the example for telecommunication. If you look at airlines, the same story. In airlines, uh, it's when we bring in, uh, well, for France specifically, specifically is when we, uh, we give some, we take some slots at, uh, at the early airport uh, and that we uh, give them to um, EasyJet. It's post-EasyJet, same thing. That's creates the competition in the market for domestic flight. And since then, you know, it's been cheaper to fly uh, in France than in the US. And that's true for, thanks to, uh, Ryanair and EasyJet, that's true for most of the uh, EU market. So that's interesting because it's, this, this industry specifically, they, they use precisely the same technology in the US and in Europe. Okay. So it cannot be explained by changes in technology. Okay. It's the same technology. On top of it, you know, these changes on, in relative prices themselves are well explained by changes in policy decisions. So I think that's what's, drive, what's driving the result. Um, now, of course, the, the telecom case is a bit extreme in the magnitude. Okay, so 40% drop in price, that's more than, the, you know, it's like the ex extreme example of a big change in competition. Um, if you take a, a balance panel uh, basket of goods and services that uh, consumed by the median uh, household, then um, the price difference is more like seven or eight percent. So this is price minus unit labor cost for the EU in green and uh, for the US in red. So prices in the US have outpaced wage adjusted for productivity, <laughs> while in Europe, there's, on average in Europe, uh, it's been more or less uh, going at the same rate. Okay. You could also think of it as, uh, I mean, it's, not, it's almost not exactly the same, but it's very similar to the evolution of relative labor shares and profit rates. So, um, Now I think that suggests that um, there might still, of course, there is still technology-driven concentration in some industries that's still going on. Okay. But the balance is that there is more of the barriers to entry type consolidation in the US and more of the opposite going on in Europe. So we know that part of it is policy. So then the question becomes, why is that policy changed so drastically uh, in the two sides of the Atlantic? And I think part of the reason is lobbying. So uh, if you want to understand how do, do, uh, you know, how do the telecom or the uh, internet providers get away with very high prices in the US, the answer is they lobby like crazy. And they lobby legislators, they lobby regulators um, to try to maintain this, uh, the status quo. And one of the things that changed quite significantly around 2000 in the US uh, is lobbying expenditure. So here you have lobbying expenditure by um, the total, that is all lobbying by all um, institutions, or all parties, and 
This is lobbying by business groups. So the difference here would be lobbying by um, NGOs or uh, consumer advocacy groups and things like that. That's for the US, and that's the same figure for Europe. Unfortunately, for Europe, we don't have like a long time series, so we don't know exactly how it was in the past. Uh, there's also an issue of data coverage, so this could be a bit more noisy. But even if you're off by 20%, you know, that's a ratio of three, so you know, there's still, the, the gap is still, uh, still going to be there um, in levels. The other thing that's striking is the, the, balance, the, the composition. There is, of course, a lot of lobbying expenses by businesses in Europe, but as a fraction of total, is smaller. So we have more lobbying by non-business groups. Um, and finally, there's a lot of uh, interesting research in political science about the, uh, the efficacy, if you want, of the lobbying, which is, do they actually win the case? And it turns out that the lobbyists in Washington are more likely to win, the business lobbyists are more likely to win their case than the business lobbyists in Brussels. Um, so I think that explains part of the diverging trends. Now, okay, so then the next question is why is it that is going on? What, what's the root of the difference? Um, and that's, now if you know the history of European nations, this is somewhat surprising because um, the idea of having very strong and independent market regulators, this is not a very French idea at all because that's the opposite of Colbertism. It's the opposite of, you know, the long tradition of intervening in the economy and, and um, having politicians influence business decisions, which is much more of a European tradition, much less of an American tradition. So this reversal is also strange in, from that perspective. But uh, so what we argue in one of the paper and in the book is that it's actually a byproduct of the European construction. So. Um, and it's, it's, very, it's very surprising the first time you think about it, but much less so when you think about it more deeply. So what's surprising is that every, most countries in Europe individually don't have a tradition of strong and independent uh, regulators. That is true. But somehow when we put the, all of them around the table in the mid-90s to design the rules of the single market, even though each of them individually in their own country did not really enjoy having strong and independent regulator. When you ask them together to design one regulator for the whole EU, they chose a very strong and independent regulator. So that's a paradox, but it's a paradox, um, you know, it's more like it has the appearance of a paradox. If you think more deeply, it's exactly what you would predict. Because these countries, at the national level, they like to be able to influence business decisions. But at the EU level, that's still true, but there's a new factor, which is they are mostly worried about the other countries being able to influence the regulator against them. Okay. So that was true between the big countries, between France and Germany, for instance. Like the Germans were willing to, they, they were, of course, very pro uh, single market, but they wanted to make sure that the EU regulator would not be influenced by the French too much. The French thought exactly the same about the Germans. And also very importantly, which is something that always people, especially in Paris, people tend to forget, the small countries would never have signed up for a single market if they were afraid that the big countries could just design the rules of the game to suit their needs. Okay. So that's also very important. If you want to have everybody on board, you need to give them some reassurance that the market regulator will remain impartial and independent. And so what happened then is when we create EU institutions, we tend to make them very strongly independent. That's exactly how we did it for the central bank, for the same reason. And that's how we did it for the, uh, mark for the Digicomp in Brussels. So I think that changed the dynamics in Europe. And then, after having done that at the EU level, it started to trickle down back to the national level. Once you have a very strong and independent market regulator for the EU, then national countries are influenced by that, and they tend to also change the regulation or the statutes of their own national regulator to make it more independent over time, which is a trend we've seen. If you, if you track national regulators, they've also become more uh, independent over time. So that's how we end up in this position, which is kind of weird the first time you think about it, which is today, the Europe has the most independent central bank in the world and the most independent market regulator in the world. Even though, you know, central bank independence, that's an idea that goes back to Milton Friedman. It's not exactly a European idea. 
and you know, strong and independent market regulator, the free market idea, that's also not something you think you associate more with the US. Okay. So that's the paradox. But the outcome, and I don't think, I think the, um, the design was uh, absolutely deliberate because we, it was like part of the, um, the design of the single market to make sure everybody was comfortable with the market. So I think that was by design. I don't think, uh, having read much of what was written at the time, I don't think people foresaw what it would do over the next 30 years. Okay. But what it did really is that year after year, on average, the regulators in, uh, in Europe are just less influenced by lobbyists. It's not zero, I'm not saying it's completely independent, but just it's less than in Washington DC. And so the cumulative impact after 30 years is that we have, we've had a more consistent competition policy in Europe uh, than in the US. Um, and I think that, that's how we ended up in this, in this position. Um, okay, so then um, to conclude and leave time for um, discussions, I just wanna wrap up by trying to put some numbers so, we, so we, you have a sense of how big the, the impact is on the economy. Okay, so <clears throat> my best estimate is that um, prices in the US are too high by about seven or eight percent. That means people pay too much, seven or eight percent extra per month on what they buy. So for the median family, that's about $300 per month. For all American consumers together uh, over 12 months, so for, uh, per, per year, it's about $600 billion. Um, so that's the extra spending just because of higher prices. And this extra spending, of course, turns in almost one-to-one -one into higher profits for firms. And since the investment has you know, been quite low, it turned one-to-one -one into higher dividends and share buyback. Um, now, so clearly if you were to move back to a competitive economy, consumer would save about you know, that much money. But of course that would not be the end of the story because if you think about an, a competitive economy versus a less competitive economy, the more competitive economy would have higher investment in innovation and a tighter labor market. So that would increase labor productivity and wages. So that the net gain would be more than 600 billion. If you calibrate uh, like a standard macro model and you do exactly this kind of experiment, so re you reduce market power uh, to the tune of uh, like a 7% change in markups, then private GDP would go up by about 5%, which for the US is $1 trillion. So if, what that simulation means is if you were to go back to the degree of competition we had 20 years ago in the US, private GDP would go up by about $1 trillion, and you would have about $250 billion of redistribution. Um, so total income goes up by one trillion, but it's not symmetry between capital and labor because labor wins twice, that means that consumers and wages go up, um, while capital income is potentially hurt by lower prices. So profit margin, margin would shrink. Now they would sell more, so it could be ambiguous. It turns out the net is negative. So you would have labor income going up by about $125 trillion and then profit go, would go down by about $250 billion. So you'd have a redistribution between households whose earning is more based on capital income towards households whose earning is more based on labor income. So these numbers, uh, for if you, if you plug them in for the median household in the US, so the 20% in the middle of the income distribution, so this is a, a family, a household that uh, whose um, you know, earnings about $50,000, $40,000, per year, that would be about $5,000 extra income, extra real income. So that's about a 10% increase compared to their current earnings. So it's a very significant boost uh, for the middle class. And um, I think, I mean, it's not the only reason, but I think that's one of the reasons for the rise in, in populism in the US today, which is it turns out that once you take into account um, the rise in prices and the rise in uh, of the baskets of goods and services, then the median household has had almost no increase in real purchasing power. So like the, the real growth of uh, you know, their income or their purchasing power was like a third of a percent per year. And given that healthcare costs uh, have also increased since over that period of time, that's eaten more than that. So the net income growth in real term uh, is almost zero. So when you read surveys about you know, why Americans 
don't trust capitalism anymore. So the main reason is that. They said, well, I just from year to year, I, my real income is not growing. Um, so in that world, 5% extra income, that's actually more than the cumulative growth over the past 10 years. So it is a big deal. Okay? And I think that, that's why this, uh, I think that explains part of the reason why this topic now is, is getting a lot of attention in the press uh, in the US. Okay, so I want to stop here so we have plenty of time for discussion and you know, I have, I have more slides but I'll show them later if the questions are arise. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so as you all uh, noticed, for those who didn't know it before, uh, Thomas is a great storyteller. Uh, nevertheless, I should point out that there is much more in the book than what you just heard, and it's really a page turner. I'm going to mention some of the stories that I found very compelling, but before I should like to say in general, I like very much the tone, which reminds me a little bit of the Lettre Persane, because sometimes you present yourself as the uh, you know, falsely naive Frenchman who uh, expresses every time his shock or surprise upon hearing uh, cliches that all his American uh, um, uh, uh, friends or colleagues uh, say with great confidence, and which to a French person appear uh, not at all obvious. For instance, the obvious but false uh, <coughs> view that the American economy is, uh, uh, has more intense competition than the, the European economy or that, productiv or that productivity growth was significantly greater than in Europe, whereas, uh, as, as you recall, and as uh, most people know, the difference in GDP growth is entirely attributable to uh, differences in the um, uh, growth of uh, numbers of, of hours worked, which itself is related to population growth. <coughs> there is also the, um, what is always very nice to, um, especially to economists, which is the kind of down-to-earth economist's attitude, um, that is, let's just look at a few numbers and that debunks uh, clever sounding cliches like, for instance, the idea that Google or Amazon or Facebook are completely unheard of kinds of companies uh, and unlike anything that happened before or as you show that be it in terms of market capitalization relative to GDP or margin rates, they are of course impressive but not more impressive than uh, the biggest companies of decades ago. So uh, this is all very nice. Among the many compelling stories you tell, uh, well, I like, for instance, uh, the description of how washing machine producers, after having uh, explained that foreign competition, foreign potential competition was so strong that they should be allowed to merge, but then when this foreign competition materialized, uh, they went to lobby uh, successfully for uh, tariffs. Uh, which they obtained uh, uh, last year. Um, and more generally, I think the stories you tell about lobbying are maybe those that are most uh, uh, new and less, least known, at least on this side of the Atlantic. For instance, about how the financial sector, how banks lobbied to prevent Walmart's expansion in banking. Also, how doctors' contributions uh, are to politicians are uh, somewhat surprisingly skewed towards politicians who oppose gun control not because they like guns, but because this happened to be the same politicians who also oppose uh, stricter healthcare regulation. Um, now, we have all these stories about specific sectors, telecoms, healthcare, um, uh, finance, and at the same time, a unifying story, the one you just summarized, that, that institutional changes, that is political pressure caused by lobbying and changes in um, the enforcement of antitrust law and, other, uh, and the work of other regulatory agencies led to more lax regulation, uh, lax antitrust enforcement, more concentration, but more bad concentration, less entry, uh, less productivity growth, and higher margins. One uh, um, thing I liked in particular was your very clever uh, identification strategy to uh, measure the efficacy of lobbying efforts. So what uh, Thomas and his uh, co-author, I believe, did was to use Europe as a, a proxy for the natural rate of, um, natural, say, fraction of cases that should be brought against companies in a given industry. And the difference between the US and Europe is seen as, is interpreted in a way, even though it's more double uh, di differences and differences, as the effect of lobbying, and you find a shocking, uh, shockingly high uh, efficiency of lobbying, that is, 
a doubling, you find that the doubling of uh, lobbying expenditures reduces cases brought against companies by 9%, which is very high. Now, I feel in, in a way, one, uh, there is in your book a kind of a tension between the stories you tell and your general theory. Because one way of reading your book, I mean, one feeling one has when reading your book is that each sector is a world in it by itself, with its own dynamics, its own kind of regulation, and also that the sectors about which you tell the most impressive stories, if I leave washing machines aside for a moment, are those that are um, um, influenced or s by public regulations to a greater extent than uh, the rest of the economy. That's the case, of course, for healthcare, uh, where we also know that market-based uh, solutions need not be the most efficient because of the magnitude of adverse selection problems, so that much investment, in fact, takes place to screen buyers without any uh, value creation. That's true also for airlines, where there is the question of slot allocation. That's true for telecoms, where how sp spectrum auctions are designed, how many operators and so on are allowed is uh, mostly uh, you know, driven by you know, the government or government uh, agencies. Uh, and so the, I think one, questions, one, one question one may ask is, you know, beyond all these very compelling stories, is there something more general that applies also to sectors that are farther away from the government? Now, of course, that's a question you answer by um, you know, quoting by your, some of your earlier work uh, showing that there is a positive relationship between increases in concentration and uh, slower productivity growth and higher margins, so arguing basically that much of the increase in concentration we, we have seen in the last decades is bad concentration. But to be fair, one must, also, um, uh, one must also mention, and that's you also do it in your book, that this is a more contentious view than some other claims in your book. And uh, uh, there was a, there's a paper which you quote, which I believe was published very recently by uh, David Otter, Larry Katz, John Van Rinen, and others, which basically makes the, you know, claims the opposite from what you claim, that is, they claim that the sectors where more con which have uh, witnessed greater uh, increases in concentration are also those where there have been uh, greater productivity gains. There is also a piece by uh, Sia and Rossi Hansberg, The Industrial Revolution in Services, which makes a similar point, but on, uh, which is more focused on specific sectors, basically claiming that uh, technological changes have... Um, um, brought about production functions with higher fixed costs and lower marginal costs, giving, uh, you know, having as a natural consequence a greater expansion for more efficient firms and which would lead to kind of good concentration. Now, I guess if we have time, I'd be interested in hearing how you, as a party to this debate, would, uh, um, would describe the current state of the debate. I mean, we have your excellent papers. We also have very good uh, authors on the other side. So. How would you explain, you know, why don't you uh, uh, manage to agree on this? Is it details about how concentration is measured? What, what is it? What is at the heart of this disagreement, which I understand is not yet resolved? I must mention regarding finance, uh, and more generally regarding the competitiveness of markets, I've been, you know, I felt at some points um, um, I was close to the, you know, lazy, uh, um, f um, American uh, interlocutors full of cliches on one aspect, which is the role of venture capital. There is, uh, I think, an accepted fact is that venture capital is much more developed in the US than in Europe. There is a significant body of literature claiming that venture capital has a significant positive impact on the rate of innovation of young firms and also on their rate of growth. Uh, so this uh, kind of uh, maybe a fairy tale view of the US as being the country where venture capital allows for a continuous flow of uh, you know, disruptive new entrants. Uh, I mean, why do, don't we see that in terms of a greater entry, uh, more competitive pressure on incumbents and so on? So what is the answer? I'd be curious to hear your view. Is it just because it is true, but it is small? It is about, uh, uh, you know, it's just too small to be seen in the data, or maybe it is offset by other factors, or is it just not true to start with? But I'd be curious to hear your views about venture capital, because uh, frankly, I was surprised not to, uh, or maybe I, uh, maybe I overlooked uh, the, uh, something in your book, but I feel did, you do not devote uh, a, a lot of attention to this, at least in, in the book, and I, I'm curious to hear about that. Now, a few words about uh, competition policy. I think your book is, is very interesting in terms of what it implies about the 
current and future directions of competent policy. Maybe I'd like to say a word first about the um, political economy and even the sociology of competition policy. Uh, I, I agree with all you said about why Europe went into the direction of uh, hyper-independent uh, authorities. I think there is another factor, which is the following. Uh, when considering the uh, political uh, influences or the uh, you know, uh, influence of various interest groups in society, uh, there is always the concern that consumers are weaker than producers because consumers are usually atomistic, so they coordinate less, whereas producers, especially in sectors that are good clients of regulators and uh, competition authorities, these are usually concentrated sectors, so firms that find it easier to coordinate or they even don't need to coordinate, they have a strong interest in trying to influence uh, competition authorities or regulators. Now, I believe one, and, and this is why, by the way, competition policy is structured in a way that is biased towards consumers. For instance, in principle, the goal both of merger control and uh, the repression of anti-competitive practices is not to promote social welfare, that would be the sum of profits and consumer welfare, uh, but to promote consumer surplus, and that is often justified as a way to offset uh, the um, greater uh, political and lobbying influence of producers. Now, this is fine. Now, I believe that one aspect of the way th works, uh, things work in Europe is that because there are many countries and in many markets, in some markets a country is a producer, but in some markets uh, certain countries are more buyers but not producers, this means that there is more political representation of buyer interest. And actually that's something we see at the very origins of European competition policy, which is before the creation of the European community that was at the time of the European community of coal and steel in 1951. Uh, so I believe the treaty was, uh, um, the, most of these rules were uh, defined in 1950. And here, and by the way, that's mentioned in your book, the French, you know, the country you would expect least to uh, advocate uh, a strong competition policy, uh, let alone a supranational competition policy. Well, but in terms of coal and steel, there was a fear from the French and the Italians that the greater uh, market power of German producers, of s German steel producers, would allow them to discriminate against uh, non-German uh, clients. And this is why, on, th on this particular market, the French were buyers, they were not sellers, and that's why they advocated for a strong antitrust policy. By the way, in the next decades, France was the country that uh, put the brakes on any progress towards European merger control. As you recall in your book, merger control was um, instituted in 1989, that is uh, more than 30 years after the Rome Treaty, which contained the other parts of competition policy, that is the repression of anti-competitive practices and the control of, uh, of state aids. And the reason was that you know, France, with its national champions, did not want them to be subjected to some uh, uh, foreign uh, uh, civil servants um, decisions. It wanted to retain, it, it was, uh, there was a fear that European, uh, a European merger control system would remove uh, the ability of the French governments to engage in industrial policy. And actually, the French relented only when French firms went to lobby in favor of European merger control simply because it would be more economical for them to have a single merger control procedure rather than merger filings in all European countries. Now, actually, uh, the very recent debates about the Alstom Siemens merger is an example of. Uh, is one more example of this representation of customers. The French and German governments wanted to pressure the, uh, and did actually at least uh, vocally express uh, their uh, uh, desires for uh, an authorization of the merger, but behind the scenes from actually what I heard and what also can be read in newspapers, uh, many governments in Europe were, which have uh, railway companies that purchase uh, trains but that do not produce trains, well, they were on the buyer side and they lobbied in the other direction. Now, to a large extent, the European Commission is immune uh, to, to lobbying activity, but even if it were not, uh, there is always uh, this, uh, there are always these countervailing interests among European governments. Uh, maybe I'd like to finish about more specific uh, implications of what you say about uh, the nature of competition policy. Uh, I think it would be a bit um, simplistic to um, view debates on competition policy on an axis between you know, more lenient or stricter. There is another um, fault line, which overlaps only uh, in part with this, which is between the traditional, what would, is called in Europe, ordo liberal view, which is mostly focused on maintaining some balance on the market and avoiding dominance by one firm, which was also uh, 
a dominant view in the United States until the 70s, at, at, but it was not called old or liberal, it was called in the US the populist uh, era of antitrust policy, that is the idea that big is dangerous, okay? And there was a shift first in the 70s in the US under the influence of the Chicago School and then in Europe towards a more economics-based approach uh, that is more grounded on, on economic theory with more focus on uh, prices and consumer surplus. Now, in some cases, it may mean a stricter policy. For instance, it may imply that some mergers that do not lead to huge market shares but still lead to a risk of price increases should be prohibited. And in Europe, it's only since 2004 that such mergers can be prohibited because until 2004, a merger could be prohibited only if it created a dominant position. Since 2004, there is a new merger regulation that mimics the one in the US and which also allows the commission to block a merger that could lessen competition even without creating a dominant position simply by creating an oligopoly that is a bit, a bit less competitive. In some other cases, of course, it can have the opposite impact. That is, some mergers with high market shares, if for some reason uh, the way this uh, market works means that there are reasons to believe that consumers will not be harmed. Okay, just w one final word. You mentioned, uh, I, I, what I like in your book is that very unusually for an economist's book, in a way, one can see it as advocating for a less economic approach to competition policy and more in favor of simple rules that may be a bit harsher on companies. Just two examples and then I'm finished. Um, you mentioned, um, well, first, one of them is um, one, one example about laxer competition policy harming consumers in the US is a ruling by the Supreme Court in 2007 that reversed a, a 97 years old ban on resale price maintenance. That is, there was, it enacted a shift from an absolute ban on producers' right to impose the resale price of their products to, to third-party retailers to what is called a rule of reason. That is, it was not always legal, but it would be subjected to a rule of reason. That is, it should be appraised case by case. Now, uh, there was a, a recent paper showing, based on the fact that this ruling had the different had an impact in some states but not others, I'm not going to go into the details, uh, that this uh, led to a significant price increase uh, and a decrease in volumes for the products that were subjected to this ruling, that is products that are purchased and resold identically without any transformation in the states where this ruling had some bite. Um, and this is very interesting because what this ruling did was exactly what the economists like. It said just, okay, it should be case by case, uh, an economic approach, but then, what it led to was higher prices. And this is simply because the real world is not an economist's fantasy. In an ideal world, which you have a case-by-case -case approach which catches everything and which uh, um, appraises every case properly, then of course it should not have these adverse consequences. But in the real world, many things go under the radar. Many things are just uh, judged uh, you know, wrongly. And, and so that's, uh, I think it advocates for a kind of sim almost simplistic approach. Another, and that's going to be my final word, you mentioned free. Now, you mentioned Free's uh, mobile license, but uh, Free uh, was able to be in this position to disrupt the mobile market because it was first able to disrupt the broadband market in 2002. Why did it uh, do that? Well, because it was helped by a decision by the European Commission, which, in a sense, found uh, France Telecom, through its subsidiary Wanadu, um, guilty of predatory pricing. So basically, there was a ruling by the European Commission which, which forced France Telecom to increase its prices from 30 to 45 euros, whereas all the competitors were at 30 euros, and that's what allowed Free to uh, increase its market share, and that's what made France one of the most, co or maybe the most competitive market for broadband. Now, what is interesting is that this decision by the European Commission uh, was, at least according to the unanimous view of economists, a very bad decision, uh, and you don't see predatory pricing if the price that is prohibited to the dominant firm is also the price that all the other companies practice. Predatory pricing is normally a price that is below cost and that is not sustainable for other companies. So that's another example of an um, economically bad decision that led to uh, competitive markets and uh, probably a very favorable outcome for consumers and uh, social welfare. So you know, one take of your book is that when sh sometimes competition policy should be a bit dumb and one should not listen to economists too much. <laughs>
Hello, good afternoon. So it's a pleasure for me to, to open this discussion. Maybe before giving the floor to the audience, maybe I will give the opportunity to Thomas to reply quickly to David if you have a few remarks, so just to, you know, two minutes. It's working? Okay, great. Um, yeah, no, so two quick answers. I think I'm just going to pick on the two first that you mentioned, the, um, you know, the debate on whether uh, we have good versus bad concentration and the superstar firms and then uh, the VC. Um, so regarding the superstar firms, I think that the, um, so the, the key test again should be that um, if you have a good concentration, we should see concentration together with lower prices, quality adjusted. And one of the reasons we don't have agreement is because economists have been too lazy and they haven't been able to come up with prices, which to me is one of the most shocking things I discovered when I writing the book, which is we still have like all the estimates that we run at the firm level, we don't have prices. We have accounting data, which is you know the price times quantity. We don't have firm level prices in any of these studies. And I think that's shameful in the era of big data and computer, there's just no excuse for that apart from a massive market failure in, uh, in the IO uh, uh, academic literature. So that's one of the reasons the, the, you know, the, the gap in our knowledge persists. So that being said, I still, they are wrong. I, I, you know, of course, that's my perspective. I, what we find is that the correlation between co uh, you know, productivity and uh, concentration was broadly positive on average up to the 2000s. Now in their data, they, don't, they, they do a pooled estimation for the whole sample. So pre versus post 2000, to me that's the key test. Post 2000, we always find that the correlation is zero or slightly negative. Uh, but I think the true answer is that as long as we don't have prices, then we can't distinguish markups from productivity. And therefore we don't know the true answer. And I think that's the, the massive failure. Um, but when you, so I think that's the broad reason. Now when you drill down to industries, you know, like the, the big, the, the, the primary examples of bad concentration that would be airlines or telecoms, I, I've st I'm still to meet anybody who would argue that the airlines of the US have become so much more efficient, that's why prices are higher. I just, I don't, I don't think nobody can make that case. So yeah, that's why I stick to my guns on, on that one. Um, the, um, and then if, uh, and when for if you want to talk about Google and Facebook, and then I think, uh, I'm sure we're gonna have questions about that, so I don't want to take too much on that. Um, and the second one for the VC market, yeah, I agree. So that's, uh, the way I think about it is more like, um, the, the US started, so if you think about what makes the economy efficient and grow over time, you roughly have three things. You have the, f the financing, the funding part, and you have uh, the uh, innovation, and then you have the competition in the market. So the US used to be better at the three of them. They have more funding, private and public. Always remember there's a huge amount of public funding via the Department of Defense for innovation. So they had more funding, private and public. They had more better universities with you know, a strong innovation ecosystem. And they also had a more competitive uh, single market. I think that now they still have a big market, so it's great for companies that they can expand over the US very quickly. But they lost the, la the, the third one, I think they've lost it over time. And now Europe has more competitive market, which is better for consumers. But I, I don't think the, over the first two, either like innovation in universities and funding, I think the US is still better. So what you see in the data is a trend starting from a very high level, and they are losing a little bit of their uh, comparative advantage. But uh, I don't think that we've reversed completely. And in industries that are very sensitive to VC funding, the entry rate has you know, declined a bit less until very recently, and then the decline is very specific, which is uh, many fewer firms go IPO, and many more get acquired. So the, the trend there, it's not so much, so then it depends what we call entry. Like, is it the creation of the product on the firm, or is it the firm going public? Because the creation of product that has kept going to some extent, but what we see is that a higher fraction of VC-funded firms get acquired instead of becoming independent. So that's, that's, that's what part of the tension gets resolved. Okay, <coughs> maybe uh, before just uh, giving the floor to the, to the audience, I cannot resist to, to ask you a kind of uh, naive or questions uh, or playing the role of a devil advocate uh, because, uh, you know, reading your book, we have the feeling that uh, Europe had the best competition policy in the world. Uh, so at the same time, 
we have seen recently, especially after the, the failed merger between Siemens and Halstom, that there was debate about it. Uh, and uh, even more recently, Margaret uh, Festager, uh, she hinted that there could be a change in the competition policy in Europe. So what is your, in your book, when you measure uh, market shares, for instance, you, you measure market share at the national level as opposed to the global level. And as you know, there is this debate whether or not, especially in our case in Europe, where we do not have the kind of uh, global uh, superstars uh, like in the US, do you think that the competition policy so far in Europe has prevented the, the rise of uh, global superstars? Or what, what do you think of the kind of uh, change that, uh, that France and Germany are pushing and that maybe Fersteiger could, uh, could accept, you know, in the way competition is assessed in Europe, uh, taking more into account uh, the global dimension. And maybe David also could, uh, could answer to this question. Well, so I, so I think that debate is very, very confused, but um, th there are a couple of statements that they are true individually and they just have no connection to each other. So we don't have superstar firms in Europe in the digital economy. We don't have the Google and Facebook. That has strictly nothing to do with competition policy. There is never, there is, there is not a single case of, you know, a decision by a national or EU level competition authority that prevented the growth of a European uh, Google or Facebook. The reason we don't have them is probably a mixture of innovation at the university level and the lack of a single market for digital services. So if these politicians want to be serious about having you know, EU level champion, the first thing they need to do is to have a single market for digital services. That should be priority number one. That's got nothing to do with antitrust. Um, then on the specific issue of the Alstom Siemens, um, it's like, you know, bringing in Google for that, in, in that discussion is like Google does not build trains, so there is no connection whatsoever. Uh, and then, actually I have a new theorem, you know, like, if you, you guys know Godwin's law, right? Godwin's law is like, the law that if you if you spend enough time on the in a discussion on the internet, with probability one, somebody is co is going to call the other one a Nazi or is going to have a comparison with Hitler. So it's like this rule of law that I, if you know if an online debate goes on for more than an hour, at some point somebody's going to bring in comparison with the Nazis and Hitler. I think my my law is if you if you have a competition about a discussion about competition or lobbying uh, in uh, Europe and the US to some extent. With probability one, after uh, more than 30 minutes, somebody is going to say because Google or because China, even if you know what, whatever the topic is, you know. Uh, so I think that's one of these examples. In the case of Alstom and Siemens, there was one potential Chinese competitor which was not even in the market and still is not in the market, and so that's kind of I don't think it was like the really good argument. And even more so, like if the goal is to have European champions then the question is what's the best way to do it? And the data is pretty clear that the best way to have national champions is to have a big market at home, which is very competitive. Because that's where the firms compete first domestically, that's where they get fit, and then they are fit to compete abroad. That's the way it works, not the other way around. Protecting them at home does not make them better on the export market. David, in one minute. Y yes, I, I, I concur with, with what Thomas said, and I don't believe there is a very compelling case for the thesis that is often made, especially by politicians and especially in France, that European competition policy hinders the uh, development of European champions. Uh, for a very simple reason, well, first, to go back to Alstom and, and Siemens, I don't believe outside of France and Germany there was much uh, a shock at this decision. That's one thing. But the other thing is that we should not forget that if the European Commission is too strict, this affects American companies just as much as uh, European companies, because most of these big mergers are b between companies that are, um, uh, you know, the, Euro Euro the European Commission has jurisdiction over companies as long as they have a significant presence in Europe, which is the case for all global companies. For instance, one highly disputed decision in the recent years by the European Commission was uh, between two uh, chemical companies, uh, Dow and Dupont, so two American companies, and the merger was not prohibited, but these companies had to divest much more business than had been required by the American Department of Justice because it had been notified in Europe and in the US and also in other jurisdictions. Now, um, so this is an example where if the approach is too strict, and that's something that can be debated, it's not uh, only targeted to your, towards European companies, but it's global. Now, where I believe there is an issue of, of uh, industrial policy, it's a very complex uh, issue, it is the fact that um, 
Europe, that competition policy, and that's true in Europe, but also in the US, is not well equipped to take into account the efficiency gains brought about by merger. Because that's the ambiguity is, we, we call it sometimes competition policy, sometimes competition law. Competition law means there are rules, it has to be predictable and so on. And when you talk about efficiency gains, it's often speculative, and so it's hard to uh, take them into account in a way that would withstand scrutiny um, in a higher court, which is always the uh, almost the only constraint on uh, competition authorities. So for instance, in Dow Dupont, what made the European uh, Commission stricter than the American authorities was that there was what is called the what was called the innovation theory of harm. That is the fear that these two companies would refrain to do R and D on projects that were overlapping in terms of a line of research, without even specifying what this uh, uh, what specific um, fields uh, this R and D would be. Now this was heavily criticized, and there have been now uh, uh, claims that if competition authorities resort to such speculative theories to prohibit a merger or obtain uh, divestments of businesses, then they should also allow for efficiency claims to authorize mergers, even if the standard of proof, even if the, if the, the arguments are not up to the hitherto very high standard of proof. So this is, in a way, a very technical debate, which I think is important because it's weird that merger control never takes into account efficiency gains, whereas most mergers are driven by efficiency gains. Now, uh, real or uh, sometimes firms are too optimistic, but this, you know, these efficiency gains are real quite often, and this is never taken into account by uh, competition authorities. I mean, it is in theory, but never in practice. So I think that's an issue indeed, um, but th there is no easy fix for this, and it's not just an issue for European uh, competition policy, but uh, worldwide. Uh, while uh, the audience is ta starting to take the mics out of the, of the chairs, um, I wanted to challenge you uh, a little bit on what you said about the fact that the best way to have a national champion is to have uh, a big market with a lot of competition. So would you say that Huawei, for instance, which is now very competitive globally, uh, it is because uh, mainly because there was a big uh, national uh, market with free competition. So how do you reconcile uh, these uh, facts? Um, and then I have a, uh, a different question, but maybe I will ask it later on. Yeah. Well, uh, so it may not be the only way, and there might be an, an, uh, But first of all, Ch Huawei was a fairly innovative company and did gain market shares by competing with the, uh, some of the European ones, actually. So uh, now, the, the in the case of, of Chinese firm, it's more like there are hidden subsidies directly from the state. So it's not so much that they may get less competitive, it's more like they subsidize them directly via loans or, uh, you know, like state aid. They don't have state aid rules, essentially. So. Um, but I think the question is, in which field, in which domain do you want to have? If you want to have an industrial policy in Europe, what should be the, f the, the main domain? I think not trains. You know, if you want to have an industrial policy with respect to artificial intelligence, uh, cloud computing, and data analytics and data protection, I think that's totally fine. And I think that makes total sense. And the, the justification is in part industrial and in large part also uh, democratic, which is, it's very, it is a domain where you know it intersects with privacy, with uh, individual rights, and with the news media. So I think they are the case for having s state funding for research development and all of that in that domain. I think it's very strong, and I'm all in favor of that. But I think that that just doesn't apply to the, a case of Alstom and Siemens, for instance. <coughs> okay, so now it's time to take a, a few questions uh, first round from the from the audience, and uh, so you have the mic in the armchair, and please uh, introduce yourself, so who starts? Yeah, yeah and it can be in French uh, if you prefer, or in, uh, I don't know, Italian or <laughs> German. <laughs> okay, Francesco, Papa da PSI, Banque de France. So uh, the graph you've shown for the gap in the investment between the top and the bottom, so uh, what uh, was striking to me is that it looks like they differ only when the Great Recession hits. So, if you. Yeah, maybe we take, uh, okay, we take two or yeah. three questions first yeah. before you answer. Yeah, so, so, so I was wondering if this is due to the fact, yeah, here. So you see, they, they look quite similar. And then, uh, right at the Great Recession, there is a difference for the top. I was wondering if there is a cyclical effect such that, uh, you know, 
those that are in the top concentration, they actually go more towards what you call the bad concentration because they can rely on larger mar market shares, whereas for the bottom one, they, they cannot, they have to keep on investing. I don't know if this is the... So take a second question. Not for the, yeah. Hi. Again, uh, looking at this, uh, it strikes me that uh, a lot of this concentration has occurred uh, at a time of very benign uh, economic growth. Certainly in the US, we haven't had a downturn in, in over a dozen years. I'm wondering if uh, there's any sense that the companies that are in the green, but uh, part of the green uh, cohort, um, would be impacted differently should there be a demand shock compared to the ones in, in the bottom? Um, yeah, so uh, it actually starts in 2007, eight, uh, the trend. Um, the, um, uh, so on that one, maybe there's a coincidence with the Great Recession. Some of the, um, some of the other graphs that I find, maybe I should show another one, maybe to, to speak about that. Uh, I think I have it here, yeah. So, so the entry, I think that's another way of thinking about it, which the, you know, and this actually also relates a bit to what David was saying earlier about the, um, uh, the Chicago school argument. Um, so one thing that changed in the US antitrust was um, you know, a big push around there, around the 80s, away from the populist uh, view of antitrust towards more like the Chicago school view. And one of the main arguments they had was that um, you should focus on uh, you know, cartels, price fixing, and all of that, like criminal behavior, but you didn't need to worry about uh, a dominant position by a single firm in a market because um, if the firm was making too much money, then these rents would be competed away by entry. So that was a, one of the main underlying arguments for uh, being very lenient in merger uh, reviews and also in general for not uh, worrying about dominance of a market. And what, what you see here is the, uh, the extent to which entry was looked like it was free. So this is the correlation um, between the entry rates across industries and uh, the excess profits or the excess to be in skew across industries. So with this number was positive here, like around, you know, the SCT is around one or something like that. Um, so if Q goes up by 1%, then entry goes up by 1% roughly uh, over the next uh, three years. Um, then, so that means that around this period of time, up, up to maybe the late 90s, um, you could, if you ranked US industries by who is making a lot of money, who is not making a lot of money, you would predict where entry would happen. Uh, it would happen more in industries where profits are high or where valuations are high, uh, which is exactly what you think about free entry. So it means that at a point in time, you might have huge rents, big profits, but they don't stay for a long time because you would have entry that would compete with these rents. The problem is that <coughs> in the recent years, um, that correlation has dropped to zero. And now this one, this is the one where the cyclical effect that you're mentioning which was, would be for potentially very important. When people look at entry, like total number of like uh, entry rates, number of information, that's very cyclical. Because of course that tends to move a lot uh, with the business cycle. Um, but what you see here, if, if instead of um, you know, the total number of entrants, you look at do they enter in more in profitable industries, that thing is much less cyclical. So there is no, I think there's no obvious impact of the, the crisis, for instance, on that one. So that's why I don't think the cyclical, cyclical effect is that strong. Olivier. Olivier, Olivier de Bant. Um, I had a question um, regarding the link in, in your analysis. You focus very much on the issue of uh, product market uh, deregulation and competition. And you only, in the case of Walmart, you mentioned labor market uh, competition. And how, how, how do you, would you view the, the link between the two, in particular in the European case, I mean, particularly the French case, I mean, I mean in the, it's, uh, it has an impact on the reforms because we have uh, uh, reaped the gains of uh, uh, product market uh, deregulation. And now it's more difficult to, uh, to what's, the, what's your recipe to introduce labor market uh, uh, reforms. I mean, what's your recipe and how do you view in the broader context comparing the US and, the, and, and Europe? Maybe if there's a second question. 
Uh, Raphael Lejeune, I'm a journalist at L'Opinion. A uh, question regarding um, EU competition rules, <coughs> and especially uh, on the relevant market. I'd like your view on the, uh, um, if we need in Europe, a new definition of the uh, relevant market, whether or not, especially after the failed merger between uh, Alstom and Siemens. So, um, on, on the labor market side first, so there is an active debate in, in the US right now looking at whether our firms have too much market power in the labor market. So that's monopsony as opposed to monopoly. Um, and uh, I think that, so my own personal view is that there is something going on. I don't think it's necessarily very large yet. So quantitatively, I don't think it's as big as the rents in the product market. And it's more specific. So in some pockets, we see an increase in like non-compete agreements which is a you know, classic case of monopsony. You just, you force everybody to sign a contract that they, don't, they cannot com work for a competitor later on. You have no poaching agreement <coughs> in, in the service sector in particular, where firms would agree not to try to hire each other's workers. That's a way of keeping the wages low. Um, so we see more of that. Um, and so I think there is a, an issue there. I just don't think it's as big as the one in the product market. So uh, quantitatively, I think it matters a bit less, but it's definitely a, a, an issue uh, to look at. Um, in terms of uh, labor market reforms in Europe, um, I think we've, we've, we did improve the state of the labor market. Uh, the question is, you know, how fast do you want to go and, um, you know, can we do more? But I think there's no question that all indicators of market participation look better today than uh, they did 20 years ago in, in Europe. Um, but I would be like, they're regulating the labor market. Th I think there are more trade-offs there than in the goods market. In the goods market, I, I'm just uh, all in favor of pure competition. In the labor market, you know, we have plenty of institutions. They are there for a reason. And so you want to make sure that having more flexible labor market is good, but you want to do it in the right way. And, you know, the right way, we have a good sense of what it is when you look at the north of Europe, but actually doing it in practice is, is not always easy. So I think we've moved in the right direction. Whether or not it's fast enough, that's an open question. So the relevant markets, yeah, I mean, so in theory, uh, it's very clear you need to, if you think about competition policy, yeah, the relevant market is wherever the, the firms compete. Um, now, in terms of the consumers, ho though, I mean, we care about European consumers. That's it. So, you know, uh, that should be the still the dominant factor and the dominant objective for any kind of competition policy in Europe, which is to be good to European consumers to make sure that, you know, they pay, they have good service, good choices, and lower prices. So that should be the overarching goal. Now, that doesn't prevent us from having a strategic view about you know, uh, global markets. And in particular, of course, foreign competition into Europe is something we also take into account. That's, I'm fine with that. Um, but I don't think that, you know, sometimes all of this is just excuses for you know, finding a ways to, and if the Chinese really want to force their own citizens to pay for uh, lower prices to build subways in Buenos Aires, that's their problem. I don't, I don't see why we should ask Europeans to pay for that. I just, that to me, that doesn't make any sense. Um, so, yeah, you, maybe, to co maybe to complement on this, uh, it's a, a, a point one often hears is the European Commission only looks at market shares in Europe and this uh, overlooks the actual strength of competitors who are not so strong in Europe but who exert uh, potential competition. Well, I don't think that's true for several reasons. The first is that uh, there is no European way of defining market shares case by case, and it depends on a case by case analysis of each market. So some, in some uh, merger decisions, you will read that markets are defined as being global, okay? Because for instance, if one sees that prices tend to vary uh, in the same way all over the world, or if one sees that a shock affecting costs or demand in one part of the world affect the prices in Europe, then the Commission is going to conclude that the market is global. In some cases, it's going to be EU-wide. In some cases, it's going to be uh, very local, even uh, sub-national. That's one thing. The second thing is that anyway, market, market definition, you know, the common view uh, is a bit simplistic, which is that firms, uh, that the Commission defines market shares, defines a relevant market, and then based on this relevant market calculates market shares and then decides on prohibiting or authorizing based on market shares. But that's not the way it works. The way it works is a much more detailed analysis of the risk of a price increase, 
so much that in many decisions now, what you read is that the Commission does not even define the relevant market. In some decisions, it says, well, there are arguments for a global market, there are arguments for an EU-wide market, but anyway, it's not, it doesn't make a material difference to the assessment. So I think it was maybe more important in the past when assessment, when decisions were based on market share thresholds, but it, it's not the case anymore. So um, I don't, for instance, in mergers, like in a case like Alstom Siemens, the kind of work that the Commission would do, the kind of analysis they would do is analyze past tenders by customers and see, you know, uh, which firms were the participants, whether uh, the presence of a certain participant changes, change the final price of the margin of the winner of the tender. It would look at whether when a Chinese competitor launched a new kind, say, of locomotive, this mirror lounge, even if it was not present in uh, among the the bidders would have an impact on the tender outcome. So it's really a detailed microeconomic assessment and it's not so much anymore an assessment based on market shares, based on, uh, on an arbitrary, uh, arbitrarily narrow uh, market delineation. It's just not the way it works now. Uh, on that one, just one thing that, that I do um, think needs to be uh, you know, worked on and, and developed, but it's very hard, is not so much you know, whether you look at a narrow market today at the point in time, but have a more dynamic view of antitrust. That's actually very useful, but it's very hard to do. And that's where we also see differences between the US and Europe. You know, like, so the idea of if, what is the likelihood that a firm would become a significant competitor in the future? How do you have rules that maybe at the time you make the decision make sense, but something happens and two years later you need to change them because the world has changed. So I'm much more worried and interested in uh, you know, updating the rules to take into account the dynamics of the market. I think that to me is more first order. Because if you think about the, um, most of the discussion today about the uh, antitrust cases in, uh, you know, for Google, for the big tech firms, for Google and Facebook and so on, it's really about, you know, uh, just looking at revenues today is not the right way to decide whether an acquisition is small or big, because we saw that they can acquire firms that have very small number of employees, very small revenues, and large valuation. Now, clearly, because they see a dynamic going forward, and the way the rules are written in the US today, uh, they don't capture that. So I think that's actually very first order. And we, try we, we should try to do something like that in Europe, and, uh, but I don't know if we are doing it quickly enough. Or, and in, so that's about the dynamics. Uh, same thing with the how fast you react. Some of the cases we in, in the against the big techs, against Google in particular, um, well, in the US, nothing was done, so you know, nothing happened. In Europe, we tried to do a few things, but sometimes we were just too slow. And so by the time you react, the, you know, the damage has been done. So that is a real issue, I think, and that's something where we need to up upgrade the tools. <coughs> and yes, you said that you had a second question. So quickly, uh, because time is uh, time is running out. Um, there is a fascinating graph uh, in uh, on the cost of uh, financial intermediation uh, since uh, 1880 uh, to, to 2020. No, to 2015. Uh, you show that uh, the cost of uh, financial intermediation is uh, has been flat uh, at two percent, and you wonder why, with the new technologies, uh, this cost uh, hasn't uh, f fallen over this period, especially recently. And uh, so you said there's a lack of competition in the financial industry. So of course, my question is about Europe. What's your assessment about uh, the maybe, some people say that there are too many banks uh, in Europe, there's too much competition, the, the, uh, the um, profitability is too low and uh, there is a risk related to that. So, and on the top of that, there is this discussion about uh, risk sharing and the idea of having uh, pan-European banks, which will be large banks, so more concentration. Uh, so what's your view on this? <laughs> Maybe is there another question from, yeah, back to Anna. There is a view that um, so the technology, so beyond uh, barriers to entry that uh, firms may face in the US or elsewhere, there is also a view that uh, technology is helping incumbents, maybe because they, they, they are helping, this technology is helping those firms to access to wider set of services and so on, and, and especially uh, on the financial side, maybe to locate more their profits uh, in, some, in, in some places where they, they, they can 
uh, gain more, and, and this would help them to, to lobby more, for instance, to get more resources. So um, do, do you think that there is um, a case for uh, so, some sort of complementarity? It's a very naive question. So is, it, is there is a case for complementarity between competition policy and also tax policy uh, and, and taxation of, the, of these firms? So finance and technology. Yeah, so on finance first. Yeah, so the, the data in the book, of course, co uh, I've updated this data, and finally in recent years, that is really recent years, like the past three years, um, we start to see a decrease in the, in the cost of finance, um, and you, you see the price pressure, and it's playing out a bit differently in the US and in Europe. Um, in the US, uh, the, the, the industry among the finance uh, sectors, among the finance industry, the one that's become more competitive is asset management. So asset management fees are going down and you'd see it in the data. So finally, you, you, and it's all because, you know, you can, if you want to run a large index fund, you don't need many people. You can just have a few computers to do it. Um, and very large asset managers can have very low fees. And, and at now it's happening, and I think it's good for households. So we see the price decline. Um, in Europe, um, it's really in banking that's happening. And also, and that's relatively new. So uh, it is true that the banking margins are smaller today, and that puts pressure on you know banks. To so I so I think it's good for consumers. And the question is like how how much of that is sustainable, um, and um, you know I think that cost cutting is going to be here to stay in finance. So I think that the idea that banks and not just banks but like insurance companies and asset managers are going to have to manage their costs and find a way to improve productivity. I think that's here to stay for sure. Um, but I think there is a plausible case in Europe that uh, we need some consolidation in banking. As long as it's cross-border, it, it doesn't create any problem with competition. So I think having more cross-border consolidation in banking would be good both for competition and for stability. And if you think there are synergies in cost, in cost saving, then also for profit margins. So I think that would be the... That would be the, the recipe. Of course, the problem is that we don't have a single market for bank mergers. <laughs> so, like, the regulators are, I mean, it's very hard to do. And there is, many, there is reluctance also in countries to let banks merge across borders. So I think that's something we need to solve. But that's another example where the solution is more single market. Oh, technology, sorry, I didn't yeah. answer. Yeah. So, yeah, so let me just, so, so I th it's a bit like what uh, David uh, said also in his discussion. I think the, there is a, there's a danger. So on the one hand, I do agree that issues with big data, privacy issues, and uh, you know, the use of big data in particular with smart algorithm and artificial intelligence, that's new and that creates some specific challenges. So I do agree with that point. But I think it, you have to be careful not to go too far the other way and think that the old rules of economics don't apply to, the big, uh, to these big tech firms. Because to a large extent, they do. And if you look at these firms from the lens of standard you know, economic analysis, then you realize that they are not that different from what we had in the past. So, like, if you think about, for instance, oftentimes you hear in the press, oh, the market valuations of these firms is unprecedented. Well, that's actually is absolutely not true. So, if you take the top five firms in the US by market cap, the, the five most valuable companies in the United States, uh, together these five firms have accounted for 10% of the stock market over the past 40 years. It was 10% in 1980, 10% in 1990, 10% in 2000, 10% in 2010, and it's 10% today. The names of the firms are going to change. Today is the Google and Amazon, and 20 years ago it was uh, Procter and Gamble and uh, IBM. Um, you know, so the names change, but the idea that the top firms have you know, a very significant share of the market, that's always been true. So if you look at their profit rates, their uh, valuation ratios, they are very similar to the stars of the past. There's not that much difference between Google today and IBM in the 1970s. Um, except for one thing, which is, if anything, some of these firms are smaller than they used to be. So because they are smaller, they are less integrated in the uh, production system of the economy. When they improve, they don't drag the economy along as much as they used to. That's what you see on this graph. So this graph is literally the aggregate contribution of the top firms to total growth in the US economy, growth in labor productivity. And it's, you have the top 20 firms, so these are the 20, just the 20 largest firms in the, in the economy. 
and uh, the other one is the top four in each industry. The difference is if you take the top 20 firms, then the industry composition is going to change a lot over time. Um, if you take the top firm, top four by industry, then you fix the number of industries, and you always take the top four. So the fraction of industries remain the same. Um, you see the, the pictures look kind of similar. Um, top four by industry, that would give you about 100, 150 firms. So together, these firms, it's a, that's a very small number of firms. Like for the US, it's let's say 100. Just by themselves, it's almost sometimes 1% of aggregate labor productivity growth for the, for the US. So it's like a huge impact on the economy. But if you look at this number over time, uh, you see that over the past, uh, since 2000, the average contribution of these star firms to total growth has been, you know, less than before. Now, of course, the economy overall maybe is growing less, so maybe they are, you know, there is some deep reason why everybody is not growing as fast as they used to, but you cannot make the case that these firms are exceptional in terms of their growth. You know, it's just not true. They are, you know, if anything, they are, they are star firms, but they are less star-like than the ones of the past. So I think that's important to keep that in mind. And the more you look at their business model, so the less surprising it is. I mean, Google and Facebook are just big ad agencies. This is just, they are running ads. I mean, there is no, it's like, there's nothing more than that, literally. But the way they do it, the way they get the data and the content and the target, the targeting of the ads, that's a bit new. But honestly, it's just a big ad market. So how much can that improve GDP? Just like intuitively, there is an upper bound, right? Um, it's less true for Amazon. So Amazon would be quite like Walmart. You know, if you look at the numbers, they, they do drive productivity. And so you, it's, you should worry about the dominant position of Amazon. But on the other hand, we do get something for it. Okay, so uh, now, so if you ba make the balance, take all of them together, and you know they look—they don't look that different from the stars of the past. So we should treat them the same. We shouldn't be necessarily more aggressive against them, but we should sh also shouldn't be like too careful, thinking, "Oh, these firms are exceptional. We shouldn't break them up because otherwise, it's the end of the world." I don't think it's true. They are just firms. Okay, <laughs> maybe uh, last last two questions. Yeah. Here and here, yeah. Uh, George Overton, just one difference between Europe and the United States I was thinking about, although maybe I have my causality uh, the wrong way, the other way around, is infrastructure spending. I mean, part of me thought that there might be some way that a lot of infra infrastructure investment can kind of unlock and foster uh, either entry or competition. I'm sure you've flown out of New York a few times in your life. I don't think. I think there was just a renovation in LaGuardia, but other than that, that airport, I don't think has changed since it was built. Um, I don't know if there are similar stories that could be told in telecom, um, although maybe that was one of the things you had in mind with uh, lobbying. Yeah, very good question. That's a good question. Hello. Um, so you mentioned that uh, the explanation for increased market power was uh, lobbying. If that's the case, then what do you think is the solution to to reduce that, so to, to prevent lobbying by businesses? And also, I was a bit skeptical about your um, idea that Europe is less, so the European uh, institutions are less um, prone to, to this lobbying, it's especially the way you said it, that they decided to be more independent. Is that enough just to decide to be more independent? Uh, how does it work exactly? Yeah, great. Two great questions. So infrastructure is actually uh, quite fascinating. Um, yeah, so we have, I mean, it's surprising because much of the literature tries to estimate the impact of infrastructure, tend to find positive effect. And so given that the, um, the, the low funding cost uh, for you know, public debt, or you would predict that you would be seeing a lot of infrastructure spending today in the US, perhaps also in Europe, but as you said, some other, in some cases, it looks like the stock of infrastructure has, has deteriorated more in the US. And so then that money would predict you should see a big boom in infrastructure spending in the US. And it's happening very slowly. So there is a puzzle there. And I, I mean, there's plenty of political economy research on that. There's plenty of uh, um, you know, estimates of cost. Something that's striking is the cost of infrastructure has just skyrocketed. So like the re people who try to look at the same thing being rebuilt today, compared to when it was built for the first time, for the subway in, uh, in New York City, for various kinds of bridges and roads, it's, everything costs 10 times more than it used to. Uh, 
literally. So like, there is as if it was like a neg huge negative product in our model. There would be like a huge negative productivity shock. Like the productivity of infrastructure has been like terrible, which is why we don't do it because it costs a fortune. And I don't. So I don't know if it has. A, nobody has a perfect explanation for that, uh, but it's true in the data. That's for sure. Um, it has sometimes it has like unintended consequences. Like one example of uh, like if you think about the transportation market, it's very very integrated. So like one of the reason planes are cheap in Europe today is because train is a pretty good alternative for many routes, and they compete and they know that. So in, in the lack of infrastructure on trains also makes the airlines able to charge crazy prices for short distance flights. So, um, so but is it, I think there is definitely a puzzle there. Whether it's a political economy reason, whether it's the legal system that's become so complex that it's very costly to do anything. But at the end of the day, in, as an economist, if you look at the data, it looks like the productivity of public infrastructure spending has been going down, um, which is why we don't see much of it. Um, so for, for the lobbying, um, yeah, so we would say decide to make them. So here's a simple example: the the, the budget of the DG Comp is, you know, very insensitive to uh, political preferences, while the budget of the FTC is very sensitive. So when uh, there was a case like in 2012 where the FTC thought about maybe investigating Google, and they promptly got a letter from congressmen saying, if you investigate Google, you might have a bad surprise in your budget next year. And all of these people were, of, of course, heavily subsidized by Google in the background. So in Europe, I'm not saying it couldn't happen. Like all the firms in Europe are free to lobby. If, I mean, lobbying is a democratic right. So you have the right to lobby. It's perfectly fine. But you know, even if you were to lobby strongly a particular deputy in, in European Parliament, uh, the deputy doesn't have the power to just cut down the budget of the DG Comp next year anyway. So that and so that's one example. The budget. The other one is revolving doors. In the data, there's very little revolving door issues between the DG Comp and the industry. It's not zero, but it's very tiny. Well, if you look at the FCC in the US, it's been endemic for the past 30 years. So that's one, you know, one example. Um, so I'm not saying Europe is immune to it, and we shouldn't be complacent. But you know, in terms of the structural differences, I think they are here to stay, so hopefully it's gonna make a difference. The other big difference, and that one I do think is gonna have a huge impact, is Lobbying takes place directly uh, as lobbying expenses towards uh, elected officials and uh, you know regulators, but also before they get elected in campaign finance. And then the campaign finance laws are just very different. So the reason the lobbyists have more power today in Washington is because it's so costly to run a campaign that it's very hard to get enough money if you don't accept corporate, big corporate donations. And in Europe, we have some of that, but it's much smaller because we have tighter rules for uh, campaign finance. And I don't know, maybe I'm too optimistic, but I don't think we're gonna change these rules. So as long as we don't, I think it's gonna be okay. <laughs> so thank you, Thomas, for this uh, very insightful uh, discussion. And uh, so I encourage uh, all of you to read the book if you have not yet uh, did it. Before closing uh, the meeting, uh, just, uh, and yes, if you could remind us of the next event organized by Banque de France and Paris School of Economics. Yes, so first there will be a break for Christmas, so. Uh, have a, a nice uh, uh, Christmas uh, celebration. And then we will meet on uh, March 30 yeah, uh, for Oleg Isoski from University of Princeton. He will, gi he will give a conference. I, I think it will be at uh, PSC. Okay, and let me thanks again, uh, Thomas and David, and, uh, and see you next time.